Most often when you look online to see what people do to legitimately earn caps in Fallout 4, people talk about setting up somewhere with a purpose-built hydro farm. I've done this before, it's fully automatic and you don't need to put in much work. However, I do prefer to dabble in other means of farming. Such as putting to work the good-for-nothing settlers who rock up at your settlements expecting a free bed in exchange for nothing. And when you don't simply hand them one, they single-handedly tank everyone's happiness. Well, how about they tank these hands? Hey. Wrong settler, but it's about sending a message. Anyways, what I mean to legitimately earn caps in Fallout 4 is twofold. One can simply open the console commands on PC and add legal tender to your wallet out of thin air, much like how banks do in real life. But this isn't very sporting and isn't very immersive. What you can do is use the various settlement tools Todd the Generous God granted us and use them to exploit the unfortunate, which is very sporting and very immersive. We're reprising the role of Bv Grobber Bobber, who was in the previous video, which if you watched it and then read the comments, you may have accidentally contracted yourself an aneurysm, just like me. Anyway, today we will be exploring a third kind of farming for caps. We farmed water, we farmed plants, and those things do earn caps, yes. But what we'll be doing next is absurd. First, we must shed ourselves of our old, weak settlement, shed ourselves of our mortal shackles, and journey south across the waste to find pastures new, a land of prosperity where our new settlement will be formed. The promised land, so to speak. But the wastes are a dangerous place. I try to defend this roaming settler from these mole rats, and accidentally punch him in the ass. You see, when Todd Howard was a kid in the chess club, he too would get punched in the ass. Thusly, he decreed this would be a mortal sin in Fallout 4. And with the end of the mole rats, the settlers are now aggroed on us. Unfortunately for him, we are a being of unbridled fury, and this experience has imparted on us valuable knowledge. Such as that where we're going, we'll need protection. Because we are only at 0.7 player scale and are a little manlet. You see, when I made Bv, I made him smaller as a joke. But in the lore, it's because he had a high concentration of lead and mercury in his diet as a child. Swimming through some radioactive water as you do, I find a suit of power armor. Bv places his face right in the cod piece and we put it on. Now I am suitably protected. I am immediately distracted and travel to Concord to fight some bandits. I am upset by the power armor because I no longer get to use any of the funny animations I have grown so accustomed to. And I like the funny animations. So I hop out and by some miracle the armor has cured my stunted growth and I have achieved six feet. The difference is gargantuan. I emerge from my metal cocoon a perfect being, although much more exposed, but at least it's funnier. Next, I'll need a companion for protection, and I know just the one I'll choose. Someone who will witness me, someone who will tell my story. You see, I need to travel to Diamond City anyway to unlock the vendors there. The more vendors we can fast travel to without exerting any effort, the better for making caps once our new farm is set up. And just outside Diamond City is Piper. You open this gate right now, Danny Sullivan. I live here. You she is extremely irritating. Out. Fortunately for us, we can skip the lengthy dialogue for gaining entry into Diamond City by simply shotgun blasting her in the face. Oh, look. Happy days. However, we can't recruit her until we get through some dialogue featuring her ignoring a small child. Very wholesome. She tries to get us to agree to an interview, and I try my best to skip the dialogue. Here's your headline. Local man says no. Gonna be like that, huh? You ready for that interview now, Blue? Here's your headline. You ready for that interview now, Blue? Local man says no. You ready for that interview now, Blue? All right, Piper. Sadly, we must sit through the interview. We recruit her, swap out her worthless clothing for the next best disposable thing in my inventory, and we're ready to hit the road. She's ready to protect me from all manner of problems. And by protect me, I mean she gets shot at while I 1v1 some guys the old-fashioned way. Which is useful because we make some pit stops to collect some small junk items such as oil, adhesives, things we won't find in abundance where we're going. I eventually lose an old flight helmet, which I give to her because it looks like a space helmet and I'm excited for Starfield. But also because her forehead is so large that if you were to look her in the eyes and then 
try to look at her hairline, you'd have to increase your game's render view distance settings. When I gave her the helmet, I had to take a bus to the next postcode to put it on her. There's no point in giving her a gun because her forehead will hit her target before her bullets do. Her forehead is so large that the Brotherhood airship, the Pridwin, nearly landed in Diamond City. The legend has it that the moon is perfectly smooth and spherical, and that its craters are simply a reflection of the light on Piper's huge forehead. We're nearly there now. Just beyond these swamps is a quarry, and buried deep beneath the quarry is the entrance to Vault 88. The reason Piper is here with me is because this place is considered difficult content at this level, and I have no hope of getting through here on my lonesome. As a team, we effortlessly stealthily infiltrate the bandit camp on the surface of the quarry. I find this one bandit deploying evasive maneuvers between these floorboards, and I try a 360 shotgun blast to mixed results. He insists there's nothing personal between us right before I punch him in the head, making his head explode because he hasn't been drinking his milk. We make it to the entrance of Vault 88 where I revert back to unarmed Ungabunga, dispatch some sentient scrotums, and then go all floor bean dorp on the final remaining ghoul. Hilariously enough, while Piper, who I have dressed in literal rags, walks towards the explosion. The passage further into the vault has caved in, making it my responsibility to now enter build mode and without any equipment, make the debris vanish with no effort whatsoever. Within the vault is Overseer Basto. What are you doing here? Actually, I'm here to offer you the bargain of a lifetime. Name it. But please. It's been a hard 200 years. I try to skip a dialogue by punching her in the face, but have a mad spasm and punch this container instead, which reduces the game to less than one frame per second. This is because Fallout 4 was coded by a team of god-tier developers who tied in the coding of damage to random objects in the world to the physics of the game engine, which causes some of the most powerful CPUs in the world to have problems with their mathematical logic, accidentally transferring your lost frames into a parallel universe through a phenomenon called quantum tunneling, inadvertently destroying entire oh. galaxies in the process. For those of you who've played this DLC before, what we have to do is clear the ghouls from this area. The Overseer is a ghoul, so I take her out on a technicality. Do what you have to do. I get to work on clearing the land of all its resources. For what is the promised land if not a land rich with natural resources, such as this broken down nuclear reactor? I strip the place bare, place the overseer's desk right on the dirt in the center of the room, and place overseer barstool in the chair. Her spirit will live on as this vault's overseer. If only she knew the atrocities that will be committed in the name of glorious farming. We activate the Vault 88 beacon. The people will need beds, a place to rest. Sleeping bags on the cold rocky floor. Hello Overseer Barstool, I'll only need a second on your computer just to do- Radio. I'm instructing Piper to do some laundry down the stairs, when I notice our first settler. Good. Very good. The settlers will need food, and that food will be exclusively meute fruit. The radioactive nectar of the gods. I place a steel foundation for our farm. This provides stability. I will then place upon this foundation these gunner cages. And what these do is simple. <coughs> Chance to capture a gunner when powered. Shut off power to release captured enemy. Ah, yes. All those boring years spent farming water and fresh produce have led to this. Now you finally understand. It isn't the produce that has done this to me. It is the experience. We stand on the precipice of magical times. Magical and also profitable. We now spend some time sleeping and we wait. The rhythmic thumping you hear on the inside of these cages signals to us that it is time to farm. Let me explain how this works. Within the cages we have some money, and while we sleep some gunner bandits sneak in. Grab the money and the cages slam shut, much like a mousetrap but for people. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe. Once I flip this switch, power cuts out and the cages open. Then these turrets should kill them all. And- Oh no. I've reworked the meat farm design. Now there are more turrets. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe. Once I flip the switch, power cuts out and the cage is open and these turrets should kill the gunners, who by the way are fully armed and hostile by choice. Therefore, fully legal to farm according to the Geneva Convention. We then loot everything they have and place it into the safe. This is good clean farming and potentially going to earn us a boatload of caps. It is a little... A little messy, but we don't have to be conscious of the environment when our environment is already a landfill. As the people flock to our revolutionary underground settlement, I elaborate on our farm design, opting for more use of scaffolding and a tiered design. Now the turrets have aerial superiority and greater numbers without necessarily getting in the way of the traffic on the lower levels. Making use of our settlement's enormous verticality is just one step towards innovating in such a way that increases the quality of life for us on the bottom levels, on the dirt levels, where we all must dwell. With the design refined, we can now take further advantage of verticality to make a kind of human battery, so to speak. That is, of course, if you consider Raiders human. You see, to pfft, they are simply conduits for loot and by extension, wealth. A tool to be exploited, so to speak. 
I'm willing to bet if we raise the level of the higher gunner cages just a small step, then they might just die instantly upon hitting the ground, which not only makes the farm more profitable, but also more humane. That is, of course, if you consider Raiders human after all. So I'll raise the level of the platform ever so slightly, much like how this will raise our killing capabilities. Uh, I mean our profit-making capabilities. It's looking higher up, pretty nice, and also completely possible as far as physics are concerned. This little ramp holds the whole thing up, and we all ignore whatever the electrical malfunction is because it's inside one of the cages, and what's inside the cages frankly doesn't matter. Overseer Barstool, I do this in your honor. I do this in your memory. A few more naps to pass the time with our army of settlers all sleeping on the ground. Not gonna sugarcoat it. They basically all farm the mute fruit, and we give the new iteration of the Raider Meat Grinder another spin to see how we do. Looks like Piper has decided to shoot at the pile of corpses. Wait, there's an invisible gunner there! <laughs> Calculated. Now it is time to profit off the farm. You see, it's not just human souls we're farming, but also their equipment. Each gunner we take down drops us the life savings of a dozen caps, their weapons and their clothing, which we can now take over to Diamond City and sell at the market. Kyle, no! I speak to Mo, who sells baseball stuff, to sell him my produce, and you'll never believe it, he just straight up says, baseball. Baseball. We proceed to sell him everything we have, with no resale value to him whatsoever because it's unrelated to baseball, but that he is obligated to buy because Todd made it illegal for vendors to refuse. I couldn't imagine someone in his situation interacting with his partner at the end of the day. Hey Mo, honey, how did you do today? Did you manage to sell all those? The par the baseball paraphernalia! His stomach sinks. This is the third time this month that he's had someone clean him out of all of his savings. By selling him random junk, he looks up at his wife's eyes. She's been hungry for so long. She relies on his income for sustenance. He looks over at their boy, Jojo Jorben Blobben, an infant. He's been looking more and more malnourished of late. He looks up at his father, his eyes glistening with hope, confident that today is the day his father brings home more. More than just the radroach meat he'd brought home the previous few days. Did you do it, Papa? Did you sell- <laughs> Did you sell the bit, the, the, your balls? Mo takes a moment, breathes in deeply through his nose, out through his mouth, closes his eyes and eventually summons up the courage to respond. Baseball. Please comment, baseball. And if you don't want to, that's fine, honey. Just comment, instead. That's probably what most of you are going to do anyway, right? Anyway, as fun as it is meeting baseball guy every time I want to sell something, I should really set up some stores at our settlement. But to do that, I first need two points in local leader. So I return to base to do some quick power leveling and notice my settlers executing some people in cold blood. They're learning. And they're also crediting me and thanking me for my help, even though I did nothing. Anywho, I have to be level 14, which is no big deal when you just have to place copious chain fences down and become as wise and experienced as ancient Tibetan monks. I level up, get the perk, and start placing shops down and assigning settlers to them. Unfortunately, they all refuse to serve me due to a bug that has been present since the release of the game, which is pretty standard for Bethesda. You guys still hyped for Starfield? The bug where if the settlement is attacked and successfully defended, they will not interact with you in any meaningful way other than to kill continuously thank you. Because in Todd Howard's house, gratitude is number one. The only solution to these types of bugs is to go away from the settlement and wait for seven days and seven nights, completely frozen in place, while all the NPCs in the area just go about the day trying to avoid eye contact with the man who's been sitting there unmoving for many moons. Quite awkward. This can be applied to all sorts of things in real life. Nervous for your exams? Wait seven days and seven nights. Bank contacting you because you're overdue on your car loan? Seven days and seven nights. House is on fire? Seven days and seven nights. All these feelings will be gone. Mostly because you'd have failed your exams, defaulted on your car and your house is burned down. But still, feelings are all gone. Problem solved. Fun fact, this is how Todd deals with- <laughs> this is He deals with the bullies from the chess club. Anyways, it's been enough time. I hand Sheffield a new Coca-Cola, and Piper tries to speak to me. I skip as much dialogue as I can, including some parts about a dead father. I continue to skip dialogue and gaslight her into apologizing. Video games are so cool. Your father died for knowing the truth. <laughs> I notice our vendors are selling a bathrobe and a chef's hat. I buy these as a symbol of comfort. Status. The hat is my crown. Something to let the people know that they gotta let me cook. You see, the people, they laughed when I started setting up the human meat grinder. They laughed when I went to repair them after each use, with the listed requirement to do so being 50 caps. How can someone possibly make a profit like this, they'd chuckle. But little do they know, it says 50 caps, but repairs only cost 5. It's just another one of those Todd mysteries, you see. I dress Piper in a lab coat because she tests my patience. And with every cycle of human farming, our wealth grows dearer. And Bv's mind runs wild with the possibilities that are yet to await us. We extend the upper portion of the farm so that more fall to the deaths immediately upon triggering. While the same four on a lower level are mowed down. 
Every day is the same. We sell our loot. We sleep our way through the passage of time. That our traps be filled with our bounty. And awake to hear the slamming of the cages. The rhythmic beat of the war drum. We summon the settlers to witness the harvest. You see, they've lived without light for so long that the times between harvest have become the darkness. They watch on eagerly. They wish to witness the sickness. We flip the switch and like God on the first day, we whisper, let there be light. The very foundations of reality begin to crumble. And by reality, I'm referring to my outdated PC. And after a brief moment of reprieve from the dark, it is over. Despite the fact that I've constructed this to be as humane as possible, there are still some that the system misses. But it is their suffering that will allow me to tweak the system to be perfect moving forward. Their sacrifice that brings out innovation. The people above ground, they're hypocrites. They'll purchase of my harvest and then look at me as though I am a monster. When in reality it is simply Bv's bounty that feeds the beast. It is because of their hypocrisy above ground that we hold ourselves to a higher standard. Those of us that show signs of weakness, such as holding a cigarette through the palms of our fist and doing weird mouth movements with no sounds coming out. Yeah? Those are the ones that need cleansing. But I, a farming man, have always found that mercy bears richer fruits than strict justice. So he shall live on, but with severe spinal injuries. I've torn down the old design and will start to construct the new. A system so clean and so humane that there'll be no risk to the population at all. I construct a series of platforms that will wrap around the entirety of the settlement perimeter, and at such a height that there'll be no need for any turrets. Simply a quick, clean kill. Of course, following a couple seconds of pure terror in the fall. With the test a success, I continue construction of the apparatus. I place as many of the cages as I can with the budget that I have from our previous farm, and we have expanded our original four cages all the way to the current 23. The cycle of profit must continue. Sleepy bvv, press button bvv, and now we watch them all fall to the deaths. They didn't fall to the deaths. They didn't fall to the deaths! That's strange. I'd always thought that death from fall damage was just a threshold you'd cross. Like in Bethesda games, don't you fall 3 meters and you're perfectly okay, but then if you fall 3.1 meters, you're caked on the floor? I accidentally deck one of my own settlers and clean up what remains of the gunners. It's a disaster. Were it not for the fact that settlers are invincible in this game, it would be over for us. I just released a gang faction who RP as the US military carrying military gear into my underground civilian settlement, completely closed off from the outside world. And here we are, seeing the concept consequence of that. Textbook shell shock. Yeah? I do what I must for my people. We take the L, but I can't sit idly by while the people on the surface laugh at our gunner farm mishaps. So I set about creating the natural next step in our evolution, a spiraling tower of steel high into the air, upon which are a dozen automatic missile defense turrets set to blast any surviving gunners that fall, knees blown out or not. I had to power level to 25 and get the gun nut perk to be able to place these missile turrets. Did I have to go with the missile defense turrets? No. Did I have to power level by placing thousands of wire fences? Also no. But did I feel a sense of authority, a glimmer of divinity, that doing this in the name of settlement security was a path to unwavering power? Absolutely not. I rest some more, and awake to the drums of war. When the people hear the sound, they know. They know it's time. The great weekly falling of the people is about to begin. And now bigger than ever. I sell our loot to the vendors in the settlements and in Diamond City. Exploit the absurdity of Fallout's overlapping menu systems to create some more copper. And apply the copper to reloading the gunner cages and place some more using our profit. I speak to Piper while there's this mold thing floating between us. Sleep again and awake to the rhythm of the war drum. The song of our bounty. Pff flips the switch and we anticipate the sound of a million blowing kneecaps. And the cries of terror that are suddenly silenced by our automated missile platform. I've moved the switch to here now so that I can witness things from relative safety. The gunners, they dread it. They run from it. Destiny arrives all the same. I sell the loot, I expand our cage capacity, and repair those that have been used. In my overconfidence, I accidentally kill a settler with the old one too, and the entire settlement turns on me. But I have looted too many stim packs from all the gunners I keep killing, and I escape into the mines where I fast travel to Diamond City, where I spend some time to ponder the choices that brought me to this moment, the moment where the entire settlement turned on me. Only joking, I simply wait at this bench for seven days and seven nights, and when I return, the people will have forgotten all about the murder. Happy days. I've completed the build. There are now 53 gunner cages spanning the perimeter of the entire settlement. With one flick of the switch, we'll order up some gunner loot. Chase that bag, honey. Oh. 
Sadly, it seems we lack the ordnance to end this quickly. Thusly, our harvest is no longer humane. It is pretty amusing though, nonetheless. I hop on down to help out, and on closer inspection, the gunners don't even spawn in with the clothing anymore, just armor. <laughs> I expand the missile platform to support more and more automatic missile turrets. This benefits our settlement defense nicely. I add an additional platform because why not? More missile turrets. Then I build another platform, this time with cheaper materials inspired by Stockton Rush and Ocean Gate. More missile turrets. So much more settlement defense. To say I've taken the settlement building mechanics and built the most absurdly decadent set of constructs the wasteland has ever seen would be an understatement. Chef Bf is nothing if not an engineer. A visionary. The settlers spin because they celebrate. They celebrate the falling of the people. Like, like it's Cinco de Mayo or something. Let the feast begin, order up! The cycle of profit begins anew. Loot, sell, toil in our newfound riches. But soon enough, Bruce's eyes glaze over. What was once supposed to be an efficient form of farming wealth had become an activity to be indulged. Piper didn't know if Bruce Gorben Schlauben is going down a path she can follow. She just follows because she has to, because she's compelled to, because Todd programmed her that way. You're blowing up the settlement, she'd say. The settlement isn't safe anymore, she'd say. But well, how can our settlement not be safe if it has 425 defense? You idiot. Pfft then orders her into a stockade and places some gifts on the floor. But hang on a second, best guest. How did you get all these mini nukes? I didn't see you construct a single conveyor belt this time. Well, check this out. There are some locations in the world where mini nukes will infinitely spawn every few in game days. One of which is the Charles View Amphitheater, where Brother James will trick you into joining his cult and then demand you hand over all your belongings. But all that's required of you is that you simply fold him behind some boxes in his in his room, followed by then some us us to the remainder of his cult following. Because back here is a mini nuke under the bed, which will respawn every few days at a location that is quick and easy to fast travel to and from. Another location requires an invitation to, so we travel to Bunker Hill. You can travel to a few places, but this is one of the nearest where Edward Deegan will spawn, offering you a job to work for Jack Cabot. We then travel over to his house, destroy his robot. Piper dislikes this, which is pretty strange when you consider that she doesn't dislike our underground human slaughterhouse. We go into Jack Cabot's house, ignore the quest, immediately run into his basement without saying a word to the occupants, take the nuke, which will respawn every few days, and rinse and repeat until we have 17 of them. Now we simply strategically place them around the settlement, a settlement that is the safest settlement in the world. This isn't an opinion piece, this is simply science. I'm going to make this the most efficient slaughterhouse. <laughs> In the game. We listen to the sound of the war drum, the slamming on the cages. The people anticipate the falling of the gunners once again, and the rich bounty that overfloweth our coffers shall grow. How about some num- Well, how about some numbers? We had 15,389 caps before this most recent, uh, dropping of the bandits. <laughs> And after selling all of the loot, we have 23,608. That nets us a profit of 8,219 during every harvest. And the upkeep on 53 gunner cages sits only at 265 to maintain plus any materials, which is usually one copper, one steel. And the raw cost of the farm is 26,500 caps, which is 500 caps per cage placed. Again, plus materials. So overall, very profitable, and I, I support your right to, uh, to human farm.
A special thank you to the patrons. You help me not expire every day. <laughs> For that, I'm grateful. YouTube recommends videos that have engagement, so leave a nonsense comment below. And if you can't think of anything, there's always something like brrr, that you can just post, and th there you go, we've got you covered. Anyway, as always, stay safe. I love you. Mwah. Yours.